Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we're delving into the insightful world of radical collaboration. Penned by the esteemed James W. Tam and Ronald J. Luyette, this revolutionary guide offers a blueprint for building effective, highly functioning collaborative relationships. James W. Tam is not only a former law professor and California judge, he's also an expert in conflict resolution and the head of the esteemed consulting firm, Business Consultants Network Inc. co-author Ronald J. Luyet is the co-founder of the Green Zone Culture Group, an organization dedicated to fostering collaborative work environments. He also serves as a senior member of the Business Consultants Network. Radical Collaboration presents five essential skills designed to transform anyone into an efficient collaborator and any organization into a harmonious and productive partnership. It offers effective strategies to navigate and manage conflicts that could potentially arise within collaborative environments. This book is a must read for leaders in the business world, managers spearheading team projects, and anyone interested in refining their ability to collaborate effectively. Tune in as we break down this guide to collaboration and conflict resolution, equipping you with the tools to thrive in any team based environment. Radical Collaboration, Five Essential Skills to Overcome Defensiveness and Build Successful Relationships. Introduction, Embarking on a Journey to Better Collaborations. When we think about accomplished figures like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, or Elon Musk, we often envision success as a solo venture. But if we dig a little deeper, it becomes clear that their triumphs are rooted in robust collaboration with others. Now more than ever, Fostering successful collaborations holds immense significance. Think about a study that Harvard Business Review published in January 2016, which unveiled that over the past two decades, the time spent by both managers and employees in collaborative work has doubled. So, how can you ensure your collaborations are effective and productive? The insights shared in this book will illuminate your path, presenting the five crucial strategies to instantly enhance your cooperative efforts. In this immersion into collaboration, you will discover how to navigate towards the green zone, why your actions need to align with your words and how straw designs can lead to consensus. Part one, collaboration demands a selfless spirit and genuine goodwill. With today's business landscape being intensely interconnected, we often see teams scattered across the world, collaborating as though they're next door neighbors, thanks to online communication. Thus, sharpening collaborative skills is no longer optional. It's a necessity. Let's dive into the five essential skills that every successful collaborator needs. These skills are so transformative, they're bound to improve not just your professional relationships, but your personal ones too. At the heart of every successful collaboration lies the right motive. This is encapsulated in the first skill, collaborative intention which essentially refers to the appropriate mindset for collaboration. The key is to navigate your mindset away from the red zone and steer towards the green zone. The red zone signifies a defensive posture, inhabited by people primarily motivated by self-interest, aiming to outshine others. When you're trapped in this zone, creative solutions and mutually beneficial outcomes aren't part of your agenda. Instead, your egoistic desires may kindle conflict. What you should strive for is the green zone, a space where your thoughts are centered around fostering successful, enduring collaboration, and everyone is guided by transparency and a cooperative spirit. Those in the green zone shun individualistic gains and focus on solutions that favor all. However, it's not uncommon for people to mistake their unconscious red zone inclinations for green zone actions, inadvertently derailing projects. That's why it's crucial to continuously introspect and assess your own attitudes, remaining open to feedback from your teammates. A beneficial exercise involves asking your colleagues to list 10 words that best describe your demeanor or approach. Watch out for words like defensive, closed, anxious, or competitive, 
as these can be signs of lingering in the red zone. Soliciting your colleagues to alert you when you've blown a trivial incident out of proportion can also keep you firmly tethered in the green zone. Part 2. Utilizing the tool of first truth first ensures effective communication and understanding. Any successful relationship is grounded on pillars of trust, honesty, and openness. The same principles hold true for fruitful collaborations. This brings us to the second critical skill for collaboration, truthfulness. A useful strategy to foster this is the first truth first tool. This tool enables teams to have candid and timely discussions about arising issues, nipping them in the bud before they escalate into significant problems. Many supervisors and managers are guilty of avoiding difficult conversations with their team members, often out of fear of causing discomfort or hurt feelings. With the first truth first tool, these apprehensions are eliminated. By speaking the first truth up front, such as saying, we need to address a challenging issue. However, this in no way diminishes the value we place on your contributions. You can maintain openness. But remember, Effective communication is not merely about what you say. Pay close attention to your body language and behavior to ensure they align with your intended message and don't inadvertently distort it. Consider this. If you say, yes, dear, I love you, but simultaneously roll your eyes, the conflicting verbal and nonverbal messages lead to confusion. Similarly, robust collaboration thrives on clear communication devoid of contradictory behavior. This helps to avoid ambiguity about your intentions and fosters a sense of trust in your truthfulness. Be mindful of your voice tone and body language to ensure they harmonize with your message's intent. For instance, if your message is about promoting punctuality, don't undermine your words by showing up late consistently. To build a cohesive team bonded by mutual trust, the leader must lead by example and mirror the expectations set for the team. Part three, effective listening skills form the backbone of fruitful collaborations. Collaboration that's built on trust and reliability isn't a one-way dialogue. It demands not just honest speech, but also attentive listening. In fact, being an adept listener brings several benefits to any relationship. When a person feels genuinely listened to, it promotes openness, encourages truthful expression, and triggers more thoughtful word choice. So quality listening doesn't only result in a more profound relationship, it also provides access to a wealth of precise information. Here are two strategies to enhance your listening skills. The first is fostering a tell me more attitude. This approach entails giving undivided attention to the speaker, which assures them that it's safe to express their thoughts confidently. Let's face it. Nobody wants to share personal thoughts or feelings with a distracted listener. Embodying a tell-me-more attitude is about genuinely listening, not cross-examining the speaker or interrupting with invasive questions. True listeners frequently use phrases like, tell me more about that, or is that so, please go on, conveying a genuine interest in the speaker's input. A skilled listener also validates the speaker by acknowledging receipt and understanding of the message. However, Comprehension goes beyond merely echoing what the speaker has said. It involves expressing emotional responsiveness to the shared message. Moreover, an apt response will demonstrate attention to other cues from the speaker, such as voice tone and body language. This holistic attention to communication details adds depth to the interaction, fostering a strong foundation for effective collaboration. Part 4. Choose judiciously and accept accountability for your actions. Do you often feel your destiny is preordained? If so, you might be overlooking the importance of the choices you make daily. Such an attitude can be detrimental to successful collaborations. Your choices impact not only you, but also your team members and all your professional relationships. Remember, only you can make your own decisions and command control over your life and these decisions are made continuously. Your workplace, your colleagues, and how you allocate your time are all manifestations of the choices you make every day. Choosing wisely is closely tied with accepting responsibility. If you're dissatisfied with your job, 
rather than directing blame at your boss or peers. Acknowledge that you are in your current situation due to your own choices. People prefer not to collaborate with individuals who fault their superiors for their workload, but take no steps to remedy the situation. Such an attitude is far from conducive to building strong workplace relationships or fostering successful collaboration. Instead, the third vital skill for powerful collaborative relationships is self-accountability. This can be attained by understanding that you hold the reins of decision-making in both work and personal relationships. If you're discontented with your assigned workload, don't wallow in negativity. Be proactive, converse with your boss, and discuss potential measures that can help boost your productivity. Owning your choices and their outcomes is a key step to becoming an effective collaborator. Part 5. Understanding your role involves self-awareness and appreciating team dynamics. For those seeking to understand the dynamics of team compatibility, there's no better starting point than the FIRO theory or fundamental interpersonal relations orientation. According to this theory, three traits, inclusion, control, and openness, primarily govern our compatibility with others. These traits are informed by our desires and fears. We all seek appreciation and acceptance from others while fearing humiliation, rejection, and disregard. The intensity of these feelings can significantly influence our relationships. For instance, if you struggle with low self-esteem or harbor a fear of being overlooked, it may heighten your desire for inclusion. Coupled with this longing for inclusion, you may also feel hesitant to include others or exhibit a deficit of openness. This leads us to the fourth critical skill for successful collaboration, self-awareness. Self-awareness involves comprehending your fears, desires, and feelings, and understanding how they contrast with those of others. This insight enables you to decipher how to integrate effectively with your team. So pose this question to yourself. How do my levels of inclusion, control, and openness compare to those of my colleagues? As you ascertain the answer, you'll gain deeper insight into your compatibility with your team. For example, if you're a CEO with a pronounced inclination towards inclusion, you would naturally gel well with other inclusion-oriented individuals. However, your approach might need tweaking when dealing with those who prefer solitude. Ultimately, flexibility is crucial for successful collaboration and for cultivating productive relationships with your teammates. Being adaptable based on the dynamics of your team promotes harmony and paves the way for effective collaboration. Part 6. Quelling conflicts begins with fostering tranquility and comprehending the issues. No matter how adaptable you may be, conflicts are inevitable when you're working collaboratively with others. This paves the way for the fifth and final indispensable skill for forging and preserving collaborative relationships, conflict management. One particularly effective technique for managing conflict is the interest-based approach. This systematic method considers everyone's stakes in a particular dispute. The initial step is cultivating an environment where everyone feels valued. Regular check-ins can help gauge which team members desire more inclusion than others and soothe those who may be feeling uneasy. Once you've gauged the pulse of your team members, you can respond appropriately. For instance, if a specific person yearns for greater inclusion, it might be beneficial to have face-to-face -face discussions with them instead of relying on emails. The subsequent step involves explicitly identifying the problems and issues. It's vital to avoid investing days, weeks, or even months in negotiations only to later discover a misinterpretation of the underlying conflict. Such scenarios can easily arise when dealing with intricate issues. For instance, company executives might assume that dwindling employee attendance is due to salary disputes, while the human resources team might attribute it solely to deteriorating morale. The truth could be that both these factors are contributing to the issue. Hence, it's the mediator's responsibility to accurately define the problem. However, these are just the first two stages in the interest-based approach. Let's delve deeper into the next couple of steps in the following part of our discussion. Part 7. 
delve into everyone's interests, including your own, and devise a backup plan. The third phase involves understanding the interests of all parties entangled in a conflict, including yours. Bear in mind that your interests aren't synonymous with your fixed position. While your fixed position is the desired outcome you seek, your interests are more adaptable, and that's where your focus should lie. For instance, suppose you're attempting to sell a car for $8,000. You have a friend in need of a car, but the best they can offer is $7,000. Your position, that you earnestly want to sell the car, is fixed. However, your negotiation tools, such as the sale price, don't necessarily have to adhere rigidly to the $8,000 mark. Maybe you could negotiate down to $7,500 if you include a bike rack and a spare tire in the deal. Another crucial factor is having a contingency plan in place if an agreement proves elusive. A well-prepared backup plan can serve as a crucial reference point when deciding what's best for you. For example, if you're embroiled in a property dispute with your neighbor over a tree removal, knowing beforehand that the backup plan involves resorting to small claims, court can guide your decisions. This awareness provides a context that aids in evaluating the proposals put forth by your neighbor. Even if receiving only half the reimbursement for the tree removal isn't your ideal outcome, it's likely better than the potential cost in terms of time and money if the matter escalates to court. Having a contingency plan in place from the onset allows you to make more informed decisions during conflict resolution. Part 8. Seeking a resolution. Dissect the issues to discover various options you can then whittle down. Let's explore the final stage of the interest-based approach to conflict management. The ultimate goal of this method is to unearth innovative solutions and compromises for your conflict. Dissecting the conflict into smaller, more tangible issues can significantly increase your chances of achieving this. Take, for instance, a labor union strike. Negotiations between the union and management often reach a stalemate over wages. However, dissecting the wage issue into more manageable components can pave the way to resolution. If you commence with the hourly wage hike demanded by the union, you could propose various alternatives to distribute the increased remuneration. Maybe the additional money could be dispensed as end-of-year bonuses or it could be doled out incrementally upon the achievement of specified performance milestones. By the conclusion of the negotiations, and after understanding everyone's stakes in the dispute, a decent number of potential solutions should have surfaced. This is the juncture to pare them down and select the most fitting one. A great method for doing this is the utilization of a straw design. This technique involves systematically examining and discussing each solution leading to one party drafting a preliminary straw design of an agreement. The straw element signifies the flexible and adaptable nature of the agreement. Once the draft is drawn up, it can be circulated for feedback, which can then inform revisions. In the labor strike scenario, proposals like year-end bonuses and performance-related rewards could be translated into separate drafts and circulated for further feedback. This process would then be repeated, progressively inching closer to a final agreement that meets everyone's satisfaction. Final Summary The central idea of this book. We live in a world where interconnectedness is the norm, and robust collaboration skills are absolutely essential. It's crucial to recognize and hone the skills that are integral to forging and maintaining collaborative relationships. A particularly vital facet of this is conflict resolution, which can be achieved by understanding the perspectives of all parties involved and crafting a solution that everyone, yourself included, can agree with. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot.
Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then, happy reading and happy listening.